When you think of wildlife, you may think of animals like bears and wolves. But did you know that wild animals like raccoons, skunks, and hawks, they all live in cities too. Any animal that doesn't depend on people taking care of it is a wild animal. Pigeons, squirrels, ants, and even cockroaches and rats are all examples of wildlife. Cities and towns are filled with wildlife. An empty city lot, a backyard, a parking lot, a playground, buildings, and even sewers are all places that can provide food, water, shelter, air, and space for living beings to survive. Animals and plants are also called living beings, living things, or organisms. A place where living things find what they need to survive is called a habitat. Different animals need different types of habitats. For example, some animals, like these doll sheep, are adapted to live in this harsh environment. Other animals, like these raccoons, have found ways to live in the city. They have adapted to live in sewers, buildings, and parks. They find food in garbage cans. These sycamore trees are adapted to stream beds and floodplains. Sycamore trees grow naturally in Southern California canyons. These trees were planted by people. The tree's habitat is the environment along this road. This environment can meet all the needs of a sycamore tree to live and reproduce. Environments are made up of both living and non-living things. Non-living things include weather, soil, air, and water. The habitat of a plant or animal thus includes other living things, as well as non-living things. The ways that plants and animals meet their needs in urban environments are often very different from those in the wild. In the wild, plants that don't grow well in bright sunlight live in the shade of trees or cliffs. In cities, plants are protected from too much sunlight by growing in the shadow of buildings or indoors. Other plants that need to tolerate more light and heat can grow on the sunny side of a building. Some things in the environment can be harmful, such as noise and air pollution caused by machines and vehicles. Other hazards may include predators or other enemies. A habitat is not only a place that meets the needs of a plant or animal, but also one that doesn't do too much harm. The habitat cannot be too hot or cold, too wet or too dry, or too poisonous. Together, all living and non-living things that interact and depend on each other in an environment form an ecosystem, which is short for ecological system. We call it a system because all these different living things and their non-living environment recycle nutrients and energy. This backyard is an example of an ecosystem. The birds, squirrels, trees, the feeder, and the bird bath are some of the living and non-living things of this ecosystem. To grow, a plant gets nutrients from soil and air and it gets energy from the sun. Animals get nutrients and energy by eating plants. Then they too may be eaten by predatory animals or people. If all the nutrients were taken out of the soil and locked up in the bodies of plants and animals, eventually no more plants could grow. But nature is the ultimate recycler. Both plant eaters and predators leave manure. When plants and animals eventually die, their bodies decompose. Organisms like mushrooms and millipedes return nutrients in manure and nutrients from dead plants and animal bodies back to the soil. 
The many relationships each organism has with other organisms make up a food web. Food webs show where each animal and plant gets its food. For example, a food web in the city park could be made up of the grass, the desert cottontail that eats it, and ground squirrels that feed on all kinds of seeds and picnic leftovers. There is also the red-tailed hawk that hunts the rabbits and the squirrels, and a mushroom that recycles nutrients back into the soil. Most of the energy that is used by organisms to live and grow comes from the sun. Plants make the energy from the sun into food for themselves and for animals. The food plants make is sugar. It is the basic food for all organisms. Because plants produce food, they are also called producers. On the other hand, animals are called consumers. This is because they cannot make their own food like plants can. Animals get their food by consuming or eating plants or other animals. Animals that eat only plants are called herbivores. Plants provide the energy they need to live. Monarch caterpillars are herbivores, and so is this mouse. It eats plant seeds. Carnivores are animals that eat meat. Predators are carnivores that catch and eat other animals. They get their energy from prey. This praying mantis is an example of a predator. It is eating a fruit fly. Fence lizards are predators of insects. This lizard is having a feast of termites. Predators play an important part in the ecosystem. By eating other animals, they help to keep the numbers down so that there aren't too many for the ecosystem to support. If there aren't enough predators, the ecosystem can become imbalanced. In this example, there are too many rabbits and eventually there will not be enough grass for them to eat. Many animals eat both plants and animals. They are called omnivores. Raccoons, skunks, possums, and coyotes are all omnivores. People are also omnivores. The final members in a food web are the decomposers, like mushrooms. They break down dead plants and animals into reusable nutrients. We could call decomposers nature's recyclers. A healthy, balanced ecosystem has a large variety of living things with many different roles. We call this variety of living things biodiversity. Unhealthy ecosystems are unbalanced. They often have a larger number of organisms from just one species. One way to understand the importance of biodiversity is to think of a food web as a puzzle, put together from all the different living things in it. If more and more puzzle pieces go missing, you cannot put it together, it falls apart. Or if the puzzle consists of very few pieces, if one or two are missing, the puzzle is difficult to put together. To contrast, if a puzzle has many pieces and two pieces are missing, we can still put most of the puzzle together. A similar thing can happen with a food web. A food web that is biodiverse consists of many animals and plants. If one of the organisms is dying off, it might not affect the whole food web. It can still function. But if a food web has very few animals and plants, then removing one of them will affect the other two, and the food web may no longer exist. For a food web to function well, all the organisms need to be able to find their food. A food web is more stable when it has a greater biodiversity. <laughs>